Oh, Father, we just look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. I ask for you to just lead us. I thank you that you have given me the tongue of the learned that I might speak a word in season to him that is weary. Thank you, Father, that I can speak as if I know straight from you, Father, because if I don't know it and if it's not from you, we don't need it. Thank you, Lord. If I begin this, how many of y'all could finish it? I've been saying it now for three or four years. Our security is not that we're in that we're right and we have everything figured out. Our security is in the truth of a father's love for his children. There are, in the world we know, and I, I have been in time, there are bad daddies in the earth. But there are most, the majority of daddies would do anything for their children. Well, God saying, if you be the mess you are, how much more will your father in heaven love us and do for us? There are a lot of bad daddies, but our, our daddy ain't one of them. Amen. We're going to talk about our father today, how, how, how good he is. I know I talk about these things a lot, but I find that I don't talk about them enough. You know, faith comes by hearing, not having heard, but these are things. I try to, every service, at least have one thing in there that moved me from point A to point B or from point B to C or whatever. It, it moved my life. It changed my life in some extreme way. And it's one of those wow moments that you have. Don't you love those moments when you f suddenly see something? And then you go, every time you go over and you sort of experience that same feeling again that you had the first time. And it could be something you have heard all your life or read all your life or maybe some scriptures you've memorized, but suddenly something just clicks, you know. There is within, and we've talked about this for many years, there is an insidious nature to all religious structures. They seem, at the end of the day, they seem to leave you with an uncertainty about your position with God. Well, you're just not really sure, you know. You feel like it, but I'm not 100% sure if where I am now. I think maybe that thing I was thinking last night or those things I did last Wednesday night or just whatever it is, we can bring condemnation on ourselves. We are very quick to judge ourselves, aren't we? Aren't we? Yeah. <clears throat> it's not like it used to be, but I, I still have folks talk to me about their unsure position with God. You know, how do I even know that I'm saved, if we can use that word? Do you ever have those moments, those fleeting moments where just you wonder, wow, am I even hooked up with God? It, I think we all do. I, it, it's really not in my repertoire a whole bunch now, but occasionally I will have just that fleeting thought, and then I put it at rest immediately when I just begin to, it just like a big splat, I begin to see everything he's done in our life over the last 40 some odd years, and actually on the other side of that, before I cried out, he was protecting us and looking after us and gently having us in right position at the right time always. But most Christians do wrestle with that a good bit. And I believe that the church has taught the congregants to wrestle with that. If you think about the prayer we most likely learned at age three or four, and this is a universal prayer. You can look at these universal sayings and you can say, how did they, how did they become like that? Well, the prayer that everybody learns to pray, and I, you've all, we've all learned a, a form of it, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord, it's a song about doubt. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I mean, you're not going to bed, you, you weren't taught by your parents to go to bed and pray for the neighbors down the street whose daddy lost his job, or thank him for all, for the roof over your head. Thank you for having, living, having such a nice family. We are taught to pray this way. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Should I die before I wake? I ain't real sure about it, but I, I really hope you're going to take me. You know, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Don't you see how that at an early age we're taught to wonder whether or not we are really hooked up? With, man, my hand's itching. What does that mean you're going to get some money? Right. Let's take up another offering right now. <laughs> what, does that, what does that really mean? Maybe it'll come true today. Um, we are taught from an early age to doubt 
our relationship with God. And a lot of churches deal with the insecurity that are given by the churches in a lot of times. We, we deal with that insecurity just about every Sunday and every Sunday night and every Wednesday night. And it's not in a comforting way. It's something we deal with all the time. Not in, not in this church and not in a lot of churches, but in so many evangelical churches and so many Protestant churches, it's over and over again. What have we done that has messed up our relationship with God? And here's what we need to do to make it right. Because we're constantly doing little things that are stupid. We're constantly doing things that we think would lead us to be not in favor with God. But I, I present to you today my case, and that is God ain't never mad at you. He's never upset with you. He's always there. He showed up in the garden at the same place, same time after Adam had messed up. Adam, where are you? Who told you that you'd blown it with me? Who told you you were naked? You know, then he went along with him because that's the only thing. He has to play our game because we get so established in our own thoughts. He has to do it our way. Uh, or we ain't going to never see it his way. It's hard to see his way. When it doesn't look like retributive us, when it's completely dropping all charges and doing nothing but love, it's hard for us to grab a hold of that. So he works through the parameters that we make up in our own construct and our religious sections that we have all over the world. Um, usually when I have those fleeting thoughts about my relationship with God. And if it lingers, if I can't get rid of it right away, I put it on that shelf that God gave me and he gave us all. I, I think that shelf is a good thing. Y'all, we talk about it a good bit. It's a place we can put things and deal with them when you feel like you can deal with them. But that's what we, I think, usually do. We just shove them there. Um, and those that don't, you know, we're taught not to do that, what I say, shove things out of your mind. You're taught, you, know, you should face all your problems and, and not be, you know, denying them and everything. I'm not saying deny them. I'm saying put, put them on a temporary shelf where if you know it'll do you more harm to try to walk down that road today than the good it'll do you if you just put it on the shelf. You should put it on the shelf always. Um, but the ones that don't put it on that shelf, the one that let, let it just overtake and eat them, they're the ones you see on the side of the road with repent for the day of the Lord is at hand. They're the ones that become religious nuts because they have no rest. It's always a never ending journey to get hooked up with God and to have everything be okay between you and God. They're so afraid. Everybody is so afraid of the punishment of God. Shouldn't the most heinous crime in the history of mankind be the one that was the biggest punishment was, and that was the murder of the innocent Jesus. And what did they decide to do? Drop all charges. Think about that for a minute. I heard this some time ago. Here's something that we need to meditate on. If you're not completely defeated by the idea of eternal, never ending, always, forever and ever and ever and ever, conscious, where we're wide awake, we can't stop the pain, we can't stop what we're seeing, we can't stop what we're hearing, we can't stop what we're feeling, for eternal conscious torment. If the thought of us making a little error that could cause a loving God to inflict that upon his children, if the thought of that does not completely defeat you, then I believe you don't really believe it. And I became convinced of that early on when I was doing funerals. About every week almost I was doing funerals. And I began to see that people really did not deep down inside believe that their loved one who everybody in the building would except them would believe there was one. That's a candidate for hell right there if there ever was one. But, they, but I believe we, and when it comes, when, when things get personal, they change. And you see what your deep beliefs are. And I believe a lot of people, when faced with it, they come to the, to the reality that, no, no, that's not a God of love. I cannot believe that about my God. I can't believe that kind of God. Daniel 7, 25 that we've been talking about the last three weeks, which is one of those scriptures that just, one of those that changed me. Um, the, he, we were talking about Lucifer, will wear out the saints of the most high God. 
He said, he'll, first of all, he will speak great words against the Most High, and then he will wear out the saints. Well, what greater words against the Most High are God's mad at you? You've blown it with God. Somehow he might accept you. He might not. Now, when your child goes to sleep at night, teach him how to pray that he might die and God might not take him. But pray that you hope that he takes him if he dies during his sleep. Just instill in that fear. That kind of Christianity will wear out the saints if you give it any credibility in your life. Do you agree with me? I used to think like that. I used to think, my goodness, a thought would come to mind and I would immediately get in that mode where, God, please, I just remember something I did back in 1953. And I was before years old. I started early. Please forgive me for that. And all the time, constantly, I'd mess up, just kind of immediately go. I'm, you can't live your life like that. You've got to know, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the whole world. He's already buried it in the sea of forgetfulness. Amen. All sins, past, present, and future. Amen. In Romans 3.25, it says we're, we're, we're forgiven for those sins that are in the past. Well, if they're in the past, that means it's the ones that are in the past was one that was 30 seconds ago. That means it was given some time ago. Remember, the Bible teaches us that the lamb was slain. What was the purpose of the, of the crucifixion of Jesus? To make us free overall, to cause us to be able to join in, in sonship with the, with the Father. The Bible tells us that the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. God had this thing figured out before we ever showed up. Isn't that a good thought? One of my main purposes in doing this, and in life, really, one of my main, for, for several years in this church, it probably was my main purpose, and that was to have people, make people, cause people to have, a, have secure thoughts about their relationship with God, that God's love was always there, that God was for them, he wasn't for, for, against them, there was nothing they could do to cause God to love you any less, and there's nothing you can do to win any more love from him, you've already got it all. That was the main thing that I would, I would teach week in, week out. And I know Otis in here today. Otis used to thank me in tears over at the Round Church. That was one of the seasons when that began in 2013. And over at the Round Church, he would come to me in, in the foyer after church with tears thanking me. He had heard all his life that God was mad at him. And now he knows and believes that God is for him. It's not against him. And God accepts him, warts and all. And that's the truth of it. But also, here's another truth that's very important. Whatever your thoughts are about God, about his character, about his, his, his authority, and whatever your thoughts are about, those become your reality, and that becomes what you live out in plain sight in front of everybody. That becomes the character that you take on in your religious thoughts about yourself as you're thinking about, and I don't say religious in a... In a, in a bad way, but in just a, a, a mimicking God way that we tend to, tend to do, you're going to mimic the kind of God that you think you have discovered in him. I, I've come to the place where I don't have those doubting things like I used to, um, but it seems like what we've done for the most part is we've looked to the church for, a, for our redemption, and by our redemption, what we have been taught is our redemption is a ticket to heaven. And then we've looked to ourselves for salvation instead of looking to Jesus. And if you stop and think about what the church says salvation is, they say it is you turning from the devil, turning to God. That's what they say repenting is. And you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and then you can start your life all over new. You, start, you get born all over again. Well, if you look the Greek word salvation up, the, the root word is, uh, the phonetic pronunciation is, is sozo, S-O-Z-O. And if you look it up, it has to do with God meeting our needs now. The things that we need right now, safety, protection, healing, health, so that you don't need healing. It's better to have divine health than it is to need healing. Uh, when we have a lack in our life, when we don't have enough to get by, enough food, enough money, all of those things are tied up in the word salvation, and you can't find anything about it being a ticket to heaven, but you can find something about being a ticket to heaven when Paul says something like this, as in Adam, all die. So even so in Christ, even mean equal, 
Even so in Christ shall, shall all be made alive in Christ. All means all in both for instances. We all fell and we all got raised up. Behold the Lamb of God that took it away. Amen. We belong to him. Paul says we were in him from the foundation of the world. We've looked to the church for redemption and then instead of looking for Jesus for salvation, we've looked to ourselves. What we can do to solve these problems, what we can do to turn our things around. And, and you do have things to do by faith. But they're going to be the things that God leads you to do in order to have those issues of salvation come to place in your life, you know. What the church should be doing as a community of believers, we should be by our lifestyle affirming the power of Jesus in plain sight for all to see. Showing how good the Father truly is. Showing how Jesus truly is on our side and wants us to win. As a friend I grew up with, and, and we traveled around together, we played music together, and we were just really tight. And whenever he was in town, he's passed on now, he would always get in touch with me. And we, we just used to run the streets and do all the sinful stuff that musicians do when they're apart from God. And, and all of this, it was a mess, you know. Well, separately, we both found God. And we both changed our life. We both had trouble with alcohol. And we both turned loose of that devil, got that monkey off our back. And it was separate from each other. But then when, we would, when he would come to town, he would always look me up and we would get together. And we really, when we got together, we could not enjoy our God conversations together. And it was really an awkward time. We were both happy with each other, but we could not enjoy our walk with God together because in his thoughts, my Christianity did not rise to his standards and without realizing it, he was being very judgmental and dismissive of what was the biggest thing in my life. And I knew he was being dismissive of it. And it was like he was trying to say, yeah, but I've got the real thing. And now looking back on it, I am just as sure as I'm sitting here today, he was thinking the same thing, that I was being judgmental and dismissive of him. You know, that ought not be. The Bible talks about the heaven retaining Jesus until we come to the unity of the faith. That's, what the, that's what's going on right now in the world. All of the stuff we're going through and about to go through, it's going to cause us to come together in the unity of the faith. It's going to be a forced thing, but it's going to be a welcome thing, and it's going to be a good thing, and we're going to rise up and find out how much power we do have. I'll tell you, that's the truth. Uh, the truth about the believer, the 20th, 21st century believer Maybe not so much the first century believer. They were in touch, close contact with Jesus. And plus, he, they had the disciples. And they saw things come to pass in the book of Acts. You know, they really saw miracles. They saw believers living the life of believers. Not just people who say, yeah, I'm a Christian. What I have come to find out is very few people who call themselves believers enjoy all of God's benefits. Some will allow themselves to enjoy some of them. Some of them don't believe that God wants to help us in those areas. But because of our buying into the fear that men have been selling for 2,000 years in the New Testament church. Now, I mean, if, if I was Satan, what would I do if I wanted to be effective against God's people? Where would I infiltrate? What would I do? If we're supposed to go to church to learn faith, which we are, amen? Do y'all agree with me on that? Yes. Well, what happens is we come to church and we learn fear. We learn fear of God, fear of blowing it with God, fear of punishment of God. Instead of that, the fear that the Bible talks about is a reverent and awesome uh, respect for God that we have, not a trembling, shaking fear. And of course, we do fear that he is all powerful, but not in an afraid way like he's the booger man. Don't say booger man. I think it's boogie man, isn't it? Is it booger man and boogie man? Excuse me one more game. The truth is, the best tactic for selling anything is fear. I told you last week, a friend of mine that had one of the first alarm 
companies in Albany, he said, usually folks call him after the, when they've got a broken window because somebody done broke in and stole something from them. And that's it. Fear does sell things. Uh, it'll, it'll sell life insurance, sell all kinds of insurance. Psalm 103, David, which I think we talked about this in another aspect a few weeks ago. This is a Psalm of David, and it's one of my favorites. And it's where he's talking to him. So he's getting his body in line. He's getting his spirit man in line with, with who he knows God wants him to be thinking like. And he says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Not just my soul, but it's all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. We can find out some benefits of God. Who forgives all thy iniquities. What is an, thy iniquities? What is an iniquity? Best way I understand it, and the best way I know how to describe it is this. An iniquity, remember Jesus was bruised for our iniquities. And bruising is bleeding on the inside of us, Right? So iniquity is something on the inside of us. It is a, it is a propensity to do certain things that dr- destroy us and bring us down. I have within the bloodline of my family that goes back, I don't believe it goes any further down from me because me and Susie years ago caught hands and believed we broke that curse in our family. But going way back, we have alcoholism all in our family. We have cancer all in our family, both sides, mine and Susie's. But we believe it stopped with us. That's an iniquity. An iniquity is a propensity. I was already in trouble with alcohol the first time I took a drink. I knew my life was ever going to be affected by that stuff. I knew it right away. And I was young. I was probably 13 or 14 years old. And I knew that it was going to be a major part in my life. I knew it that day. Now, I, didn't, I don't remember nothing about that day when I first drank a Coca-Cola, or I first, first drank milk, or I first drank orange juice, or I first drank a Dr. Pepper. I don't remember ever thinking that. But that day in the laundry room at 901 Fifth, where I reached up and got down a bottle of Ancient Age and I took a big slug of it and it went down and I suddenly was warm from head to toe and suddenly all the things that upset me just seemed to have like warm honey pour. I knew that that was going to be a big part of it. I already had the trouble. It was already in me, and that was an iniquity. He forgives all our iniquities, and we know he forgives by dropping it. It's gone. Amen? Who healeth all thy diseases. Not, well, not about the big C. Don't be afraid of that word. You're stronger than cancer. Dear goodness. Who redeems thy life from destruction, who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. We've always thought that to mean good food to eat. I believe that he wants us to eat good food too. But I believe he's talking about here, he satisfies our mouth with good things so that our youth is renewed. Things that we speak out of our mouth that cause our youth to be renewed like the, like the eagles, the sowing and reaping of that. Forget not all his benefits. That's what it means to be saved. All of those things that were lifted that David was talking to himself not to forget the benefits of. Safety, protection, prosperity, health, healing, preservation, wholeness. In the Old Testament, it was nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken, nothing torn up. Everything we, everything we need for us and then enough to turn around and help somebody else with the overflow. That's God's idea of prosperity. That's what it means to be saved, to have our, have, our, have our needs met, knowing that it all come from God. And all we want is other people to have this, this relationship that we have found with God. You know, when Jesus sets the scene for the, the one time that all folks agree on, all religious scholars agree that the story of the prodigal son and his father is, is the parable of that shows how God operates with his children. Everybody agrees on that. And he sets the scene for that, for talking about the, 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 the shepherd that loses one of his sheep when he's got 99, and then the lady that lost the silver. And it's very interesting, some things in there. The things that I got in this, I'm just going to go over it very quickly. Some things that I got out of this years ago that changed me forever in my security with, for God. It, it was one little thought that just changed everything about my thoughts of ever losing relationship with God. This is one of those 
things were, oh, I see. It, it was a definite epiphany, definitely straight from the Holy Spirit of God. Luke chapter 15, verse 4. <clears throat> What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, doesn't leave the 99 in the wilderness to go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying, y'all come on up. We're going to have a party because I found my sheep that was lost. I say unto you, likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner, over one that is missing the mark and fouling up, over one sinner that changes his mind. You cannot make repentance say anything other than metanoia, change your knowledge, change your mind over one guy that's missing the boat and changes his mind saying unto them rejoice with me for I have found my sheep which was lost likewise they shall be joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over 99 just persons which don't need to change their mind they've already found these things out Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, doesn't light a candle, get her flashlight, and sweep the house looking diligently until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together saying, come on, let's rejoice together. I have found the piece that I lost. Likewise, Jesus is saying, I say unto you, there's joy in the presence of angels over one sinner that repenteth, that changes his mind. And he said, a certain woman had two sons. Excuse me, a certain man had two sons. Then he tells the story of the prodigal. And you know the story, the prodigal wanted his inheritance and he took off and it must have been a whole bunch of stuff and went into another land and just lived the life of Hunter Biden, man. I mean, he was just doing what he wanted to do using every kind of drug that he could get a hold of. And they think were very similar to they are now when it comes to folks getting down and getting funky. You know that, don't you? Ain't a whole bunch changed in the last couple of thousand years. And that's what he did until he went broke. Just like today, you take an inheritance, you win the lottery. If you ain't got a found a good foundation of Jesus and God, you're going to be broke. And not only that, you're going to be in bad shape in your health. That's what happened to him. He went into a far country and partied, blew all his money. We learned on harlots, spent all of his, all of his money and ended up feeding the swine, feeding the herd of swine with that uh, somebody gave him a job. And he ain't supposed to have anything. He's a Jewish man. He ain't supposed to have nothing to do with swine. But there he is and said he would gladly eat the leftovers that the swine don't eat. And he said, what can I do? And he decided he would go home. He came to himself. Everybody in here either has or is going to come to yourself one day. And when you come to yourself, you realize that you need God. That's simply all it is. I can't do it. I need somebody beyond my power, beyond my mom and daddy's power, beyond the doctor's power. I need a power in my life that is strong to fix my brokenness because that's all I've got is brokenness. How many, if, it's a good thing to come out of that, ain't it? Dear goodness. And so he went home and they were having a party. And in verse uh, 25, Let's see. And his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. Now think about it. I got to think about that. They had dirt floors, didn't they? They might have had raised floors. But on a dirt floor, you got to be hoofing it to make enough noise where you can hear the dancing out down the road a piece. They must have been really partying. They must have had them amps cranked wide up and on 10. And he called one of his servants and said, come here. What's going on here? And he said to him, well, your brother came home and your father killed the fatted calf. That's, that's code talk for we're having a party because he has received him safe and sound. And, and the brother was angry. He was really mad and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and entreated. He came to him and tried to convince him and pleaded with him and tried to explain the whole thing to him. And still, you know, not wanting him to then him leave and go into far land and leave everything. And he answered and said to his father, after his father said, you know, son, your, your, your brother was out. He was living the life of him. He was a mess. He was dying. Now he's home. He's going to be with us forever and ever. And he said, father, all these many years I have served you. And I never transgressed at any time your commandment. You tell me to get up at six in the morning. I'm up at five. I've done everything you've ever asked me to do. And I lost my place. Ba -da 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 -da. I've never tr neither transgressed any of your commandments, and yet you never even gave me a billy goat that I might have a party with my friends. But yet you killed the fatted calf, and, and your son comes, other son comes home. You never even gave me a goat. And he answered and said, As soon as, as thy son was come, who had devoured his living with harlots, 
Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, you are always with me. You'll always be with me. And all that I have is already yours. It was the thing we should do to make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. That's it. That's the key. I hope if you've learned it, I hope you learned it here. Because I learned it here. If you are lost, you already belong. God can't lose something that isn't already his. The shepherd lost the sheep that already belonged to him. The lady lost the silver coin that already belonged to her. We got lost and we found our way back home to God. Carl, Carl Jung, the Swedish psychiatrist who had a lot to do with the founding of AA and didn't know he did until recently. He was helping some people that had addiction problems years and years ago and he found out that the only thing that would help them would be a relationship with God. He discovered that. He was one of the first psychiatrists that tied in our mental health and where we are with things with the relationship with God. And that's what he said about all people who are addicted. They are looking for they're home. They're homesick. They want God. They don't realize it. I said that all the years I played music after I quit drinking and I was still going back in the nightclub, everybody in there was looking for God as hard as they could. They just didn't know it. They're looking for God. The son didn't know that he belonged just because he had convinced himself he had blown it. The son in there, he had to come to himself. He had to have an epiphany. He had to have a direct input from the Holy Spirit of God for him to come to himself and realize that he could go home. That when I talked last week about um, TD, um, um, Pat Robertson's death and how much he had meant to me, every night I would listen in a drunken stupor usually on a stolen cable channel, I would listen to the repeat of the 700 Club and I would hear him at the end of the program, him and Ben Kinchlow, one or the other, or both of them in, together, would give an, a, a call out for people to surrender to Jesus. And I listened over and over and his kindness about how good God was and how God loved us in spite of ourselves and all of those things that you know that are inside me. And T.D. Jake said about Pat Robertson, he said, Pat Robertson led the, ba the baby boomers home. That's exactly what he did. He led me home home. That's what we do when we do that thing called getting saved. Now, a lot of people, you know, they're scared of going to hell, and so they pray a prayer, and they say, oh, yeah, I'm saved now. And ain't nothing changing. It. They weren't seeking God. They were afraid of God. That's not loving God. That's being afraid of God. You can't love somebody that you're afraid of. But the man who has his life changed and transformed, that's the believer. That's the one who begins a little by little to have the world chiseled away by the Holy Spirit and he begins to emerge as a new creature. He begins to emerge as Jesus in the flesh. Amen. Amen. I, I believe with all my heart that had the wayward son lost his life tragically while he was away and the father had got report that the son had died he would do everything within his power to go and retrieve that body and bring that body to be buried at his home. Yeah. With all my heart, I believe that. And I don't believe for a minute that the father wasn't praying and believing that he was coming home because he had a calf that was already fatted and because he saw him coming from afar off. He was praying and waiting every day. That's the way God is with us. You can't get away from it. If you're lost, it means you already belong. God has a plan that is for all of his children. Amen. Do you believe that? Yes. The Greek word that is translated devil in the New Testament is diablo, from where we get the word diabolical. When something's diabolical, it means it's slick. It's sharp. It'll trip you up. It's a pretty... pretty clever scheme. What better way to keep us from finding our purpose and us being able to fulfill our destiny than keeping us bound to an uncertain relationship with God, 
to wear us down by making us unsure whether or not Jesus is for us or if it this, this week he's mad at us. That is tiresome work. You agree with me? Yeah. Unless you settle it once and for all, and I hope if you haven't settled it once and for all, the thought that if you are lost, it means you already belong, that should help you. That should help move you. It sure helped move me. But honestly, the, church, the truth is the church needs returning, paying customers. And the church hasn't done it on purpose, but that's what, it, what churches do. And when church attendance get real bad, they rent a sign, put it out front, get some expert to come in from out of town, which is what somebody from out of town is. They're experts. And they come here to tell people how sorry they are and how what big sinners they are so that they can say the prayer and stay in church for a little while until they fall back into their evil ways and they sin again, then they have for church. Then the church group goes and gets them and says, you need to get back in church. So they come to church, pray the prayer again, things go good for a little while, and then they start messing up again and think they've blown it with God, so they disappear again. So then the church visiting team goes and visits them again, talks them into coming to church. They come to church, hear how lousy they are. They... The church needs returning, paying customers. I believe teaching the constant goodness of God, the everlasting love of God that Paul said there's no way we can get away with it, so nothing can separate us from that love. I think it keeps God's people giving to the righteous cause that God sets up in various places. I believe just out of, out of gratitude. That's what we do, what we've done now for 43 years. And it works, but the pastors have not learned, by and large, in the United States especially, that you can trust God with every situation. We've forgotten his benefits. You can trust God with every situation. So he is, without realizing it, he falls into that returning customer thing where he has to preach sin in order to keep the numbers up. And he doesn't even realize he's doing it. He shall speak great words against the Most High. God's mad at you. You've blown it with God. God's the one putting sickness on it. All these are great words against God that are believed within the church. God will send you and burn you for eternity because of something your mama did. All these things, that, those are awful words against the Most High God. First John says we love him because he first loved us. That love has always been there and it will always be be there. Amen. The Bible teaches us in Ephesians to give no place to the devil. It says in verse 26 of Ephesians 4, Paul says, be ye angry and sin not. How many of you know what that means? I'll give you a lesson. Tell you what it means. Susan and I were at the store the other evening, and I'm not going to go all the way with it. And they were, I'm not going to check myself out, folks. I've already got a job. There were two lines, long lines, that of the only two that were open. And I was about third back. There was a lady from me that was about three back. She had a buggy full of stuff. And she told, when the person in front of her went, she told the man in front of me who only had one thing, please go ahead of her. And he went, I thought, oh, that was nice, that was sweet of her. And then she proceeded to come over and get where he was in front of me. <laughs> and so, what's going on here? I began to come, I was George Costanza's father for a minute. <laughs> and I start talking as loud as I can about, is this the way it's done now? It's a, and Susie looking at me, you say one more word and I'm <laughs> leaving you here. And she knows I don't know how to use debit card in machines. She, and she, she said, I'm telling you, say one more word and I'm out of here. And so I would, well, be ye angry and sin not. I caught myself mid-sin. Actually, she caught me mid-sin. Do you know what I'm talking about? That's on, that's on that lady that did that. That's not on me. But now it's on me if I respond in anger. If, if I respond in anger. Do you agree with me? Yes. <laughs> You're quick to agree there, honey. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. That's me and Sue have been married 47, eight years. Oh, boy. <laughs> We've been married a good time. Somebody told us, everybody's been told that. Everybody's married been told that. 
It is a good rule to have. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Really, don't carry anger about anything into the next day. Sell it before you get in bed. Work it out. Just like I worked it out about that lady got, that's on her. That's not me. Bless her heart. Maybe she had something. Maybe her stomach was cramping. Now, you know, I don't know what it was. Something wasn't right. Neither give place to the devil. We're told that's our responsibility. Now, I'm, I'm going to throw in the next line, and they're going to charge extra for it. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good. Get a job, do something, working with your hands, producing good things. It seems like it should say that you may not have to steal, You'll, you will... Uh, be able to take care of yourself. But it doesn't say that. It says that you may have to give to him that needeth. Here's something I learned years ago. I don't work to make my living. I work to make my giving. Always, the laws of sowing and reaping are all through Scripture. Here he's saying the priority when you go out and you do something to make money, the priority is what you give away. Give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men heap unto your bosom. That's the way it's set up. You can participate or not. We chose to participate 43 years ago, and it is never, not once, let us down. But I just want to see, it's all through there. We've read it a lot of times. A lot of times we've read these things and don't even think about them. But you're going to find the laws, the, re, the laws of reciprocity all through the Bible, Old and New Testament, because that's the way the earth and us are set up to operate. That's the way we have children. Amen? Okay. So give no place to the devil. That's a pretty big responsibility. How do we give place to the devil? I don't think we've got time to go over all the ways right now. I think, I can probably think of the number one one. How would that be? How about if I were to think the number one way that we give place to the devil? Now remember, the devil was stripped of his power. Wasn't he? Didn't the Bible say that? He was stripped of his, God, of his, of his power. Um, and, and, and that's what Jesus said. He'd come to destroy the works of the devil. But he's still having success. One, the number one way that we give place to the devil is we spend so much time talking about our ailments and our woes and our problems and what all's going wrong in our life. I was listening to one of my favorite um, constitutionalists on YouTube early this morning, and three times he was doing a live thing. He'd come up on an accident with a car, and he was doing a live feed um, of, of the wreck and th he had just left the gym and three times during that he said my shoulder is killing me three times he said it my shoulder is killing me three times he said it my shoulder is well, what's the big deal it's just words honey life and death is in the power of the tongue you don't go around talking your troubles all the time. All that does is make the troubles get more and more. And I, I, I think of it the way I heard it explained by Charles Capps years ago. And that is your angels, which the Bible says, they, part, they hearken to the voice of the word. We're the voice of the word. So as we're sitting there saying, my back is killing me, the angels are saying, well, I guess he wants his back to kill him. They don't know. They just do what they, they respond to our voice. I don't know if it works like that or not, but it, thinking that way was enough to make me get my tongue in shape. Do you agree with me? But I believe that's not the number one way. Be it unto you according to your belief. And Jesus says in Mark chapter 11, you know you have what you say. You can't get away from that. Death and life is in the power of the tongue, and they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. They that say, I ain't nothing to it, they're going to eat the other stuff of it. Caught myself. All right, all right. Are y'all getting anything out of this? I am. Listen, folks. Things are serious right now. Things, you might not even know it, but you're in the most serious time in the recorded history of civilization, if you know it or not. I'm telling the truth. There could have been some things that were bigger, but if they, are, they were, they're not written down anywhere. You better have these things that we're talking about 
in operation in your life because it's going to get down to you and God. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to turn around. Things are already turning around. But you better have these things ready to put in operation. They need to be in operation in your life right now. We do not have time for any kind of doubting game with our beliefs. Remember, the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let not this man think he'll receive anything of God. You've got to know. You can't spend all of our spiritual energy on a system that is based on doubt and fear. Listen, this will simplify your theology. I believe this will be sufficient for the time that we find ourselves living in right now. This will simplify what you think about the Bible and what you think about life. And it's John 10:10. 10, 10. The thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and rob. Jesus says, but I have come that they, that's you, might have life and have it in abundance. Now catch this. Jesus referred to Lucifer as the thief. The thief comes not. He steals what ain't his. One of the things he steals is our power to use against ourselves. How does, he, how does he do that? By getting our tongue. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. It's hooked up to the tongue. And if you want to add the angels into that, it starts making a little bit of sense, doesn't it? Hmm? As a thief, he's gonna, he'll wear out. He'll wear us out physically, too. We're caught in this system where we have to work eight hours a day, but we're gone from the house ten hours a day. We have to spend this many hours running our children to and fro. We finally get in bed by 10 o'clock. We're exhausted. We get up the next day. It starts all over again. We're on this treadmill because we are consumers. We have to raise money so we can keep on consuming. And I read close to 60% of the people in America are one paycheck away of going down. That means they can't take a break. They're caught on a treadmill that the devil put them on. We have been enslaved for years, y'all. Did you see the, did you see one of the owners of, of was it Black Rock or was it Vanguard that was from 19, from a few years back talking about how we have to force their behavior and he's talking about you and me. These are the puppeteers. Said, said we have to force their behavior and that's what they've been doing through the media is forcing the behavior of the people based on fear. Telling, getting you to hook up to fear in every thought that you can imagine and you get to where you don't even think God can. Well, you never find out because you never go there. You, you always, you're still going to be your Savior. Hmm. Wearing the people out. Satan is an energy thief. He loves to wear you out by, I'd be doggone if I didn't just delete my how did I do that? I just deleted my message. Let me go here. How do you get it back? You pray real hard in Jesus' name. I can't remember how I get it to pull up. That ain't how. That ain't how. That ain't how. I can't find it. Maybe it didn't did delete it from this one yet. I love it when things like this happen. You know, I live for moments like this, but suddenly I feel like I'm up here butt-ass naked. <laughs> and I, I think it snatched it off of this one here. Wow. Well, I just have to finish it. I can't find it on the phone. You got to take it off of there, too. What was the last thing I said? Y'all weren't listening? <laughs> he is. <laughs> I, by the way, that's a biblical word. If, you know, I, we get some. I, I, said, I threw one at three all. Last week, and last week's message, y'all didn't even get, and it was one of the most crude words we use all the time, but it came out of Scripture. Um, I'm not going to repeat it. No, I'm going to repeat it. I, I, I got by it last week, didn't say it, didn't say it. Y'all hear what I just said? 
Um, he, he loves to wear us down to where we ain't got time for no new thoughts about God. It's bad enough the thoughts I've got about him now. I might find out he's worse than I think he is now. You know, no, no, no. God is always good. He's always there for you. You are his child. It's, today is Father's Day. And I believe with all my heart that God's present from us today is us believing on him. I believe that's what gives him pleasure. Uh, apart from faith, it's impossible to please God. Isn't that what the Bible says? Apart, what is faith? Believing he's going to take care of you. He's going to. He, he's not going to leave you to yourself. He's not going to leave you to try to fix all your broken things. We are just absolute experts at tearing stuff up. It scared me too, honey. <laughs> Amen. I ain't got nothing left. I can't remember where I was supposed to go. Did y'all get anything out of this? Wow, got us that 15 minutes early. Now somebody can learn how to get into my stuff here. If you can do that, figure out how to get this message back. <clears throat> know that God is not the dammer. God is the one that is for us. And it's not expecting God to meet your needs is not being greedy. The love of money is the root of all evil. Not Money is not the root of all evil. You have to have money to play the game in this, wor in this world. You have to have money. No matter, you, you have to buy things from bad people to get through this world. It's just the way it is. But I believe we're in a time right now, this, there's a couple of <clears throat> things coming out. I'm begging you to please watch. July 4th, a movie called... Um, Help me. Um, um, freedom. Fre freedom. Oh, freedom. Sound of Freedom. Sound. Sound of Freedom. Jim Caviezel, the guy that played Jesus, he is in this movie. And it, from folks that have saw the first um, printing of it, which was about a year ago, and now they've, re they've redone some things, this movie is supposed to be one of the top movies ever made. And it's here to wake up the people of God. Also, Mel Gibson is doing a four-part thing on pedophilia. Please watch it when it comes out. There's a lot of things. Have you seen everything that's going on this past week? Things are being exposed and revealed like never before. But at the forefront of all of this is God. This is a God thing. And God is moving so fast. The enemy is moving so fast. He's making stupid mistakes and doing funny, goofy things. And he's revealing himself in his own cleverness. He's getting caught. You know, our spiritual warfare, the way we look at spiritual warfare, growing up in church, when we began to go to church after about 10 years, and we started going to church, we were in the Pentecostal arm of church, the things that we saw that were represented to us as spiritual warfare, so many of them were really almost cartoonish. And it was like a, a fix for something that jumps on you, like, you know, come out in Jesus' name. I rebuke you, Satan. And that's be like, we, we're wanting to play a, a quick game of checkers with the devil when the truth is he plays chess. And sometimes it lasts decades. He's got patience that we need to take an example from him and his patience. He can set you up for 10 years to destroy your life and just sit back and watch you walk right into it. Here, here, here is... I'm going to give you spiritual warfare, all you need to get through what we're about to go through. And that is fear not and believe only. Fear not, only believe. When the little girl was just about dead and they came to get Jesus, the centurion's daughter, and so he was going to go see about her, but then the lady with the issue of blood came and they got all jammed up. Then one of the men came from the house where the girl was sick and said, don't trouble Jesus no more. She's already died. She's dead. No need to come, Jesus. Jesus looked at him square in the eye and said, fear not only believe. Then he cut everybody loose except those strongest around him, went to the house, and raised that child from the dead. Amen? Amen. Fear not. 
Be not afraid. If Jesus tells us to fear not, and we're told to fear not in the Bible over 350 times, 366 times, I believe, we're told to fear not or be not afraid that many times. If he tells us to do something like that, that means it's part of our soulish realm, which is part of our will and our emotions. It's part of our will, our mind, our will, and our emotions, our, our, our soulish realm. If you're told to do something that you will to do, you can do it. So fear not. Replace that fear with faith, knowing that God wants to provide the needs you need in that situation. Believe only. Only believe somehow God's going to get you out of this. Pay attention and admit to yourself you could have been wrong about some people. You're going to have to come to the place where you say, I think I misjudged them. I think they have been deceiving me because deception is just about everywhere you look. If somebody's got a camera pointed at them, just about every one of them is deceiving us. That's the truth. But praise God, there are some unscripted Christians out there who probably will never grace the walls of a church, but they are rising up with the power of Jesus in their life because they simply fear not and they believe only. They showed up in, in Jesus' name. I don't know how it even worded because it's nothing like I've ever seen. I've seen them everywhere all over the internet. They come to God knowing their lives are met and seeing somebody else who trusted God, and so they trust God. Next thing you know, God is using them to encourage other people to trust God and they're believing God for everything and they're seeing God come to pass in their lives in everything they do. And that's, that, that has become, I would, like, I would say it's organic, but it's not. It's Holy Spirit that is causing that to happen. That's it. I'm, I'm really through it. That's good stuff, isn't it? I love it. Uh, God bless y'all. Um, Father, in Jesus' name, let us Know that we've heard from you, Father, and I ask for these seeds to be planted tightly in the soil of our heart, Father, and help us not to have them snatched up by the enemy coming immediately. Father, right now, we're going to take care of those seeds. We're going to feed those seeds with root. Going, going over this sermon again, reading these scriptures and, and playing them for ourselves, Lord, and, and thinking about them and meditating on them, Lord, and we're going to see you come to pass in our lives. I love you, Lord. Happy birthday, Father God. In Jesus' name I pray. And the church said...